I will be presenting the activities of X Initiative. X is a new nonprofit space in New York City. Uh, and I will be focusing particularly on one of the events that we, hold, we held in June 2009 called No Soul for Sale. Um, let me go to the first slide. Okay, X Initiative is located in Chelsea on, in 22nd Street in a building that you see in this image that used to host the DIA Center for the Art. Um, DIA bought the building in, back in the 80s and turned this industrial space in a beautiful exhibition space. Um, when DIA left the building in the middle of 2000, the building has been vacant for several years. And about a year ago, at the peak of the recession in December 2008, a group of art professionals led by Elizabeth D approached the new owners of the building to inquire the possibility of using the space for free. And that they agreed in the end, and that's how X Initiative was born. Um, the building is a beautiful industrial space of about um, 40,000 square feet on four floors. Uh, and when we, we got the building in January, we knew that our program would only last 12 months because the owners donated the use of the space only for one year. So we knew from the very beginning that um, our enterprise would be a very short-term enterprise. Um, we, unlike many other institutions in New York, we didn't have years ahead to program exhibitions and events, but we only had about a month. Um, and we wanted to be an underground space, but at the same time have a certain elegance and institutional aspect. Um, and we like to call ourselves the happy children of the recession because, of course, it's only through the recession that we, we got the use of the space for free. Um, so basically, back in January 2009, we um, founded a nonprofit space, a nonprofit organization. We established a very small team, which is basically myself and three other people. Um, and we established also a board of about 50 art professionals from all over the world. Um, and the board is, um, partic participates in our activities by submitting proposals for exhibitions and events on a regular basis. Um, we operate with an extremely limited budget. We fundraise ourselves, um, but at the same time, we want our space to be free and open to the public. So all our exhibitions and events are free. We have organized so far 12 shows and more than 50 events, uh, symposiums, lectures, performances, and concerts. Um, and the idea for the shows is to offer this amazing uh, museum quality space to emerging and overlooked artists. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna run through a few images uh, of our exhibitions. Uh, oh, actually, we came up with the name of X um, because we liked the, we didn't know actually what X was going to be, so we liked the idea of uh, using a variable as a symbol of this new institution. Um, and one of the first things that we did, we approached the DIA Center for the Art um, to ask whether they were interested to reinstall the Dan Flavin that used to be in the same building uh, many years before us. And they agreed, so now we, um, when you come and see the space, you can also admire this beautiful light piece that is installed in two stairwells of the building and it's visible both from the inside and and the outside. Um, we, did, we divided our program in three phases. The first phase, we invited two artists from New York, Mika Tajima and uh, Christian Holstead, and we did a large survey of Derek Jarman. Uh, Mika Tajima occupied the ground floor and she exhibited a selection of her previous work together with new production. Um, we devoted uh, quite a and like a big amount of space to Derek Jarman, who is, uh, was a British um, filmmaker who died in the 90s, um, and whose work is not that well known, especially in, in, an, in the art context. And what we showed was a body of work 
that consisted mainly in eight millimeters uh, films, and we screened about 18 films on three floors of the space, and it was a very immersive experience, and each floor had a different soundtrack. And on the rooftop of, um, of X, there is a small gallery, and we invited uh, Kristen Holstead to do a site-specific project. Um, the gallery is usually very bright uh, because it's got a skylight on top, and he turned it into a sort of bunker. For the second phase of exhibition that took place in the summer, we invited uh, a different group of artists. We invited three emerging artists from Europe who are fairly well known in Europe, but at that time didn't get the chance to show that much in the United States, especially uh, with solo exhibitions in a large exhibition space. Um, so we invited Karen Sitter, Luke Fowler, and Tris Vanna Mitchell to exhibit on one floor each. Uh, this is an image of the exhibition by Karen Sitter. Karen Sitter is a young artist in her 30s from Israel uh, who exhibited a selection of videos and uh, drawings. And the whole uh, exhibition was conceived as a choreography, as a dance. Uh, we screened about six videos and six drawings that were going on and off at different times. So the viewer was supposed to explore the exhibition space in an active way. Um, and then on the third floor, we invited Scottish artist Luke Fowler um, to exhibit a selection of his films. And because at that time we had done many video shows, we wanted to create a different environment for his videos. Uh, instead of an immersive experience like we did for Jarman, we basically kept the whole floor empty and dark. And the only thing that we did, we built a sort of floating theater that you see over here. Um, there was just a box uh, that um, was floating in the space, so the viewer would come in and see a very dark space, and then this weird object in the middle of the space glowing in the dark. Uh, and then inside, we built this sort of very simple theater that allowed us to show his, his films in a more intimate, with a more intimate experience. And then on the top floor, we invited British artist Tris Vonna Mitchell um, to exhibit a selection of his previous and new works. His work is mainly based on slide projectors and sound pieces. Um, on the rooftop gallery where Christian Holstad was in phase one, we invited a young curator and artist from New York City. Her name is Margaret Lee to curate a group show that was called Today and Every Day and brought together um, a number of New York-based artists. And then on the roof outside, um, the building has this beautiful rooftop uh, that um, used to host a Dan Graham pavilion when Dia was in the building. And when we got the building, the roof wasn't in amazing condition, but at the same time, we wanted to use it for the summer, for having events and screenings, and uh, like an open air cinema. So what we did, we invited a, an architect from LA, his name is Jeffrey Naba, um, to come up with a fun and summery solution for us, and cheap solution for us to use the roof. And he um, took inspiration from the many helicopter pads that are around Chelsea and in a way created a sort of fictional helicopter pad on top of our roof by layering few uh, astroturf in the shape of an X. So seen from above, you would see a big X on top of our building. Uh, and as a seatings, he came up with the idea of using pool noodles, that is the favorite summer material for kids. Um, and basically we bought 5,000 pool noodles that a team of um, 30 interns and collaborators as cut and assembled for more than 30 days in the building. And um, they came out as benches in the shape of X. And this is the final layout of um, the rooftop, which we basically used throughout the whole summer from June to October to screen videos and films, to have concerts and performances. And while this was going on on the upper floors, the ground floor, we decided that for the summer, we wanted to keep it 
uh, more informal and more like a dynamic space. Instead of installing an art exhibition, we invited another architect, his name is Fritz Hag, um, to turn the ground floor into a meeting point, into a gathering point. And what he came up with was he installed four geodesic domes or tents in the space and sent out an invitation, an open call invitation to um, the art community and underground groups to come and occupy temporarily these tents. So basically you would walk into the ground floor and there was always something going on, Activ like art activities, more traditional performances and dances, together with cooking lesson and dance lesson. And everyone was, was um, welcome to come and occupy these tents. Um, in November, in, as many of you know, New York hosts an important biennial for performances that is called Performa, and we were one of the main venues of the biennial. Um, we hosted during the three weeks of the biennial more than 12 events uh, on the ground floor of the building, and I'll just run through some images. Uh, this was a performative lecture by the Bruce Equality Foundation. This is a performance by Shana Lutker, a ritualistic dance by Ryan McNamara, and another dance performance by Tamara Toon and Emily Coates. Uh, and just about 10 days ago, we opened our last phase of exhibitions, which will be on view until February, when we will be closing. Um, for the last phase, we wanted to do something slightly different from the summer, when we invited mainly young artists. Um, for the first time, we hosted a group show in one of the main exhibition floors that was called Ecstatic Resistance and was curated by Emily Roisdon, who is an artist. And then we invited two very different artists from different generations. Uh, the first one is Han Sake, who is an extremely important artist for our contemporary art history but for some reason hasn't had a show, like solo show in an institution in New York since 1986. So we approached Hans Hake and asked him if he was interested in doing an, a solo presentation of his work. And he agreed, even if we basically approached him not even two months ago. And he agreed because we approached him with the idea of reinstalling uh, one of his most famous installations uh, that is what you see right now, that it's from 67 and it's called Wind Room. Um, and it's, very, it's a very simple installation. The original version did not have the bonus sign on top, but it was simply six fans, very industrial, powerful fans uh, that blow air on, onto your face. Uh, but the main feature of the exhibition is that the windows of the exhibition space are open and the exhibition takes place in the winter. Uh, and of course, uh, now it's still warm, but if you come back in January and visit the space, there will be basically snow and ice flying into your face. And he basically, uh, he told me that he really wanted to recreate this piece during the past, but never had the chance because no institution in the world would allow him to have the windows open. And so that's one of the reasons why he accepted. And the exhibition also includes uh, new artworks that we commissioned him and other artworks from the 60s, the recreation of pieces from the 60s. Um, and on the second floor, we invited a Polish artist, his name is Artur Zimieski, who is a mid-career artist, uh, to, for his first US survey. He is an amazing artist and has selected a um, few works from the 90s and from 2000s, together with the US premiere of an amazing video installation that is called Democracies, which is what you see right now. And Democracies is a video installation from 2009 which includes 20 monitors, 20 flat screen monitors, uh, which depict scenes of protests from all over the world. Um, political protests, social protests, sport protests. It's a very cacophonic and loud piece. And it's an investigation of what happens when people get together in a public space. Um, 
another example of what happens when people get together in a public space uh, was done when we organized a festival called No Soul for Sale. No Soul for Sale um, was an idea that one of our board member, members had and was um, the idea of doing um, an alternative model of, uh, like an alternative to the, the model of the art fair. Um, we wanted to invite, um, instead of commercial galleries, non-profit organizations, artists, collectives, uh, and all those realities that live in the undergrounds of the contemporary art. Um, in a way, the festival was created to celebrate all the, like the independence of all those people that live outside the market um, and to create a convention where things are not for sale. This was our logo, very Italian. Um, so the idea was very simple. We, did, we have, again, three exhibition floors and about 30,000 square feet of exhibition space which we divided equally in equal lots. Uh, and there were 40 booths or 40 lots. Um, and then we invited 40 organizations from New York, from the rest of the United States and from Europe to come and present their activities. And they, they did at their own expenses and the space was given for free. Um, because we are also a nonprofit and because we basically have no budget at all, uh, the only thing we could afford was to mark the outlines of each space on the floor instead of building walls or partitions like you see here in a classic fair. Um, and we simply used uh, tape. So some of the spaces did have a wall in the end because those were the walls that were already in the exhibition space. Others were just central spaces with no wall whatsoever. Um, and that was done because of um, budget issue, but also on a more conceptual level, we really wanted to emphasize the communication and the coexistence of these realities and spaces that would have to share a space in a very physical way and be coexisting next to each other. Um, another aspect of the layout is that we abolished all the, those safe areas or zones like corridors or waiting lounges that usually see, you see in art fairs because we also wanted the viewer to be uh, confronting the art and the people that were exhibiting in a very direct way. Um, and one of the uh, idea behind be behind the, the layout was also, one of the inspiration was also um, a movie by Lars von Trier that is called Dogville and you probably have watched it and the movie is set in a two-dimensional setting and it's uh, this fictional city whose um, edge and, and perimeter is only marked on the floor with a simple white line and the movie itself is about hospitality on one side and hostility, and those were kind of our two main characteristics of Nozzle for Sale. Um, so this is the empty space, and this is when the participants arrived. Uh, the participants were very, very different. We had more classic um, non-profits, like White Columns from New York, Storefront for Art and Architecture, or the Swiss Institute, um, together with more underground realities, like what you see here, um, it's um, the intervention of a space from Philadelphia called Flux Space. And they came with a truck and installed this two-story building in the space, in the 20 square meters that they had assigned. Um, and the second floor had real grass on the floor and there was an office where you could go and have meetings and they could present their own activity. Um, this that you see here, it's... Um, it's a space that we gave to our art handlers. We worked with an amazing team of art installers who are also, uh, the majority of them are artists themselves who don't really get the chance to show in a space like this. So we gave a couple of spots to our team too. Um, this that you see here 
It's a project by Swiss Institute, who, which is a space from New, in New York City. And what they did uh, was they produced a newspaper that was, called, that was called The Guard. And the newspaper was free. You could just take it. And what the project was, they uh, invited a group of artists to contribute with text and images to the magazine. And what these artists had in common is that they're all now pretty famous artists like Wade Guyton and Meredith Sparks, but what they share in common is they were all, they all used to be guards at DIA when DIA was in the building. Um, this is a view of the third floor, which uh, shows on the left Dispatch, which is a curatorial office in New York, and this is Ballroom Arfa. This is another view, next visit, the space from Berlin in foreground. This is not an alternative, an amazing organization from Brooklyn. And this on the back is Wage Artists. Uh, Wage is another collective from New York who did something very, very simple and yet very effective. They brought a donation box uh, for their own activity, donation slash suggestion box. And, um, and they just had a very simple stencil with which you could stencil their slogan, which reads as Wage Rage on T-shirts and tote bags. Uh, what you see on the right is a project by K48, which uh, was a, an inflatable black cube in which you could actually walk. Um, and this is a view of the second floor which shows that the juxtaposition between a very traditional layout and a more um, creative one. On the left, you see the project by Storefront for Arc and Architecture, a space uh, in New York City. Um, they have been producing a magazine or a publication from the 80s, and this is a timeline of their publication, a very museum quality display. And next to them, was Latitudes. Latitudes is a curatorial office from Barcelona who invited um, another um, collective, this time from New York City, called the Bruce Equality Foundation, uh, who basically brought over to X a bunch of furniture that they stole from an abandoned Burger King in Governors Island and which was used by Latitudes as their own office to display their activities. Uh, this is a view of Rhizome, and we even had a space that was located in the freight elevator. The building has a beautiful old uh, freight elevator that can host more than 60 people, and we invited Forgotten Bar Project, uh, an organization from Berlin, to come and install a moving bar in the, in the elevator, um, and also an art exhibition, and the bar would move every day floor, so you never know you never knew where it was that day. Um, and the festival was open between noon and 9 p.m. Afterwards, uh, we wanted to use our beautiful roof to do activities on it. And we invited Studio Film Club, which is a collective of Peter Doig and Che Lovelace from, um, um, from Trinidad to curate a film festival on the rooftop and every night you would have um, activities going on. And on the ground floor, what we did, we, ke we kept the ground floor empty and we only, uh, we invited the each exhibitors to do something for one hour. Um, and people were doing um, classic screenings or discussion and also more creative acts. Like here, you could come and have your air cut. Um, this was a music performance and a ritualistic dance between an orange and a Tropicana bottle. And this was the crowd for the opening. Uh, the opening, we had more than 2,500 people, which was, for us, a record. And over the, the week of the festival, we had about 10,000 visitors. And the New York Times defined the festival the Olympics of nonprofits. Um, and I'll conclude with this image, which was a project by artist Rob Prout. Uh, because it illustrates some of the components and contradictions that made the festival a success. Um, Rob Prude um, created this tote bag that you see here, 
um, which appropriated the Barbara Kruger logo, I shop therefore I am, and he altered it into I shoplift therefore I am. And the bags contain items that were stolen by the artist himself in stores and dailies, and a picture of the artist himself in the act of shoplifting. Um, and we realized that um, the bags were for sale, but in the end, many of them were actually stolen themselves during the opening nights. Thank you so much. And they were doing some incomprehensible movements and shaking orange juice and <laughs> it was just fun. <laughs> <laughs>